I am delighted to discuss important issues related to computation, complexity, and to some extent AI with the computer scientists, physicists, and uh, the genius, I might say, Stephen Wolfram. Professor, welcome to Morocco. Thank you. Uh, you were invited as a distinguished guest by Mohammed VI Polytechnic uh, University. Uh, what's your first impression on the campus students and the overall efforts made uh, to generate synergy among uh, several scientific disciplines here in Morocco? Looks promising as a start. Nice looking campus. It's uh, interesting to meet uh, lots of lots of people there. I think um, my my impression is that um, sort of the things are set up to be ready to go. It's not it's not clear that yet things are completely going, but it's all set up in the right direction. That's great, my great. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, it is the, the really the kind of initiative that that must be welcomed. So just to put uh, things in a um, in context. Um, UMCSP gather uh, this in this an annual event, so-called uh, Science Week, uh, uh, La Semaine de la Science in French, uh, well-known researchers and thinkers. So you and Edgar Morin and other brilliant minds, uh, you've tackled complexity as, an, as a fundamental notion across most uh, scientific disciplines. And because today uh, th the world has stopped being simple. <laughs> so uh, yeah, precisely, w what is your take on, on complexity? Well, so I, I've been interested in it at first as an aspect of natural science, not so much social science and so on. Natural science, the question is, you know, you look around in nature and so on, and you see all kinds of complex forms. And the question is, how does nature manage to make all this complexity? And that's something I got interested in, I don't know, 40 years ago or so now. And the thing that I was very excited about was that it turns out that by thinking in terms of computation, one gets kind of a, a way of understanding and explaining sort of the secret that nature has that allows it to make all of this complexity. And that's, that's become sort of a foundation for a lot of other things that I've had a chance to think about. Uh, a lot of things where there are applications back to computation itself, thinking about what it means for, for AI, thinking about what it means for kind of the how to think about the interaction of AI with, with us humans and so on, thinking about uh, uh, implications for things like the foundations of physics, what, what the universe is actually ultimately made of, those kinds of things. So uh, let's try first to explore the relationship between complexity and computation. Uh, so, as a computer scientist, uh, I guess you spend your days automating things uh, around you. Uh, is there anything that can be automated today? Well, so the you know my my goal has been for many years, and what my company has built, so to speak, is a computational language for trying to express things that happen in the world, things that exist in the world, whether they're cities, chemicals you know, paths on the surface of the earth, whether they're, uh, you know, things that are purely abstract, representing these in a form where one can apply computation and computers to deal with them. And that that's, um, uh, you know, I think the thing that people think about uh, with the, the sort of the progress of automation, the thing to understand is, uh, in the end, automation takes human goals and lets them be implemented and executed. Okay. The goals are not automatable because the goals are, you know, to decide what you want to do, that's a matter for, for us humans. Um, when we look at, uh, the, the, if we look at the natural world, for example, it doesn't have a similar what it wants to do kind of uh, uh, angle to it. That's something that we humans bring to, to, uh, to things is we have goals, we want to achieve things. The question of how we can automate the achieving of those things, that's up to what you know, technologists like me and so on try and make possible. Um, but I think that the thing to understand is um, the, the, you know, the goals you can make automation that will tell you if you do this thing, these are the things that might happen, or this is what it will take to do this thing. But to know what it is that you ultimately want to do, that's, a, that's an ultimately human cultural kind of uh, activity. In 2002, you published uh, your book, uh, A New Kind of Science. Uh, in your book, you argue that, uh, and I'm 
speaking un under your supervision, that the universe is di digital in nature and operates on fundamental laws that can be described as simple programs. And these types of systems are needed to model and understand the complexity in nature. So for you, the universe is more order than chaos, right? That's a complicated story. So, I mean, in the last three years, we've made tremendous progress in actually understanding what the universe is really made of. And the answer is that, uh, you know, down at the very lowest levels, you can think of it as a very abstract structure. It's these sort of elements, these, these atoms of space that are sort of all related to each other in something which we can think of as a giant network and so on. It's very abstract. There's no, there's nothing which we would sort of say, this is a real thing. This is, this is just some complicated structure. For us, at the scale we're at, we identify the sort of large scale features of this as being things that we consider to be real part of our actual reality. Now, at the lowest levels, the things that are happening are very complicated. They're what I call computationally irreducible. There's no way to work out what will happen except by actually following the computation. At the lowest level, that's, that's how things work. The big surprise is that the universe is at all predictable to us. If it was just that things were happening at that lowest level of computational irreducibility, we would never be able to have an expectation of being able to predict what will happen next. So in other words, it would be as if everything that we see is kind of like the randomness that you see in a turbulent fluid or something like that. But in fact, in a sense, the big surprise is that the universe is comparatively orderly, that at our level, we can describe things, we can say, you know, we, we throw something, we expect it will just continue its trajectory, it won't, uh, it, and we can, we can predict what's going to happen. So for me, the universe at, at its lowest levels is, is computationally irreducible. It's, it's full of things that we would not be able to sort of follow. But the thing that emerges above that is a level where, where we are able to make predictions and that's how we come to sort of exist and, and uh, lead the lives that we lead is because at, there are, there are, within this whole sort of universe of, of computational irreducibility, there are slices of reducibility, slices of predictability, and those are the ones that, that we, we sort of, uh, uh, those are the ways that we interpret the universe. So uh, why did you choose to uh, choose as a title of your book, A New Kind of Science? You know, it's, it's funny because I, I started off thinking I was going to talk about complexity and that was the main focus of what I was doing because that was, that was sort of the main use case for this new view of, of how science should be built. Uh, actually, it's funny because people, you know, at the time were shocked by the fact that one could say, oh, it's a new kind of science. I, I would say that, you know, Galileo, for example, had a book called Two New Sciences. So I was, I was a step down from that. Um, but, uh, uh, the, um, uh, I, it's, it's been kind of amusing to me in, in recent years. People sort of say to me about the book, you know, they'll, they'll describe what, what's going on and they'll say, but it's not like something that we saw before. I guess that's why you called it a new kind of science. But, but really the, the, um, uh, the way I s saw it and see it today is, you know, in the 1600s, there was sort of a, a big period of progress in science that was led by people like Galileo and Newton and so on, in which what they were doing was to bring mathematics into a description of the natural world to say, that you know we have nature and we can describe it using mathematical formulas and so on. That has gotten a long way. It's led to much of the engineering and so on that we have today. My goal was to kind of introduce a new foundation for making models and thinking about the world, a foundation based on some, which we can describe in terms of simple programs. Really, when I say programs, I could be just saying rules that just specify this will happen if this happens and so on. In our current world, the, the notion of a program is something somewhat familiar, so that's a good sort of uh, cognitive hook to use to describe what's going on. But really it's, it's about sort of systems of rules and their consequences and understanding the science that you can build from that. And I, you know, in, in recent times, I've kind of sort of understood that there are sort of have been about four sort of big epochs in the history of, of science and, and making models of things. I mean, the first was in antiquity when people realized that there actually might be 
simple models for things at all, that, that it might be the case that all these different things we see in the world might all be made of some small number of kinds of atoms, or these things might, there might be some way of, of having a description of, of all this diversity in the world that was a simplified description. But it was very kind of just structural. It was like, what are things made of? Then in the 1600s, the idea of mathematics being applied to the natural world came in, the idea that you can describe what you see in the natural world in terms of mathematical formulas. Then in the 1980s, kind of with my efforts particularly, this idea that you can have, that you can describe things in terms of computation. Um, and then more recently, the thing that's come out of this uh, effort to understand how fundamental physics works is what we call the multi-computational paradigm. It's a, uh, one way to think about this is in the view of time that these different uh, types of models have. In the, in the sort of structural period in antiquity, it's just like, what are things made of? It's not, there's no dynamics to what's going on. It's just, what is, what is the, the system made of? And, and that's many fields of science still are based on that kind of thinking. Then 1600s, we've got mathematical formulas. They've got a notion of time, but time is just a, a variable in the formula. You can just set it to be any value you want, and you can work out the formula. What's happened in the in the 1980s and, and towards my, my book, New Kind of Science, um, the uh, uh, this time becomes something that is sort of represents the progress of computation. It represents you do this step of computation, this step, this step, and you can't jump ahead. It's it's an irreducible thing. You can't you can't just figure out what the answer will be um, without following all the steps. And then the, the the kind of the most recent thing is the idea that time is not just a single thread of progress. There are multiple threads of time which are branching and merging and so on. One feature of that is if you are observing that system, that there are multiple things that are happening. And for you to observe it, you have to kind of have some way of knitting together those different things that are, in some sense, happening underneath. And that's so it's a necessary. This is quite similar to the relativity of Einstein. Well, it, it, it manages to explain why that theory is true. Okay. Um, so it, it, it's a very, to me, very exciting and beautiful thing, which is that, that in the end, the interplay between computational irreducibility, this phenomena that you can't compute except by following each step, mm -hmm. together with our limitation as observers, that we are capable only of, of sort of doing computationally bounded observations and so on, together with another, another thing, which is that we, we believe that we are persistent in time. So in the underlying structure of the universe, the atoms of space that we're made of change all the time. But yet we believe that there is a consistent us that exists through time. Um, those two things turn out to allow you to derive uh, special relativity and general relativity, which is kind of a spectacular thing, because one had thought that those were just features of the universe that happen to be the way they are. What is now clear is that they are derivable from their necessary feature of how the universe must be, given the way that we are as observers of that universe. So that's a, uh, but, but this, this notion of, of many threads of time um, is something which, uh, yes, it's a slightly complicated story, but basically that is the thing that, that is the reason that you get relativity. It's also the reason that you get quantum mechanics. Mm. It's also the reason that you get statistical mechanics, the, the law of entropy increase and things like this. All three of those sort of core theories of, of 20th century physics turn out to come from the same basic idea. Okay, so let, let's get back to, to science. Um, do you agree with the idea that said uh, that um, science has never gone beyond the stage of hypothesis? Well, gosh, I mean, it's uh, the, the question, you know, there's a question of whether the natural world is the way it is and we just get to make certain observations and then have to use some kind of induction to say, this is how the rest of the world must work, yeah. given our particular um, uh, you know, observations. Yeah. Um, the, that is different from the way that, for example, mathematics has traditionally been viewed. In mathematics, you say you set up certain axioms, for example, and then it is a necessary conclusion from those axioms that such and such a theorem must be true. Yeah. In, in natural science, 
we haven't had the point of view that there is an underlying reality, so to speak. There's some, some underlying thing from which we can derive in the same kind of way as in mathematics. One of the things that's come out of what, what we've been doing is that actually it does seem to be the case that in physics, like in mathematics, there is a sort of uh, a necessary uh, way of deriving what goes on. The thing which is tricky is that what is underneath all of this, it's a thing we call the Rouliad, which is a, a kind of this, this thing that represents all possible computations. And it is a thing which has to be the way that it is. It is, it is not something where it's like natural science, where the world might be this way, it might be that way. It's something much more like logic or mathematics. But even below that, it's something which has a, a necessary structure that has to be the way it is. Now, the question is, why is the world that we see the way that we see it? And the answer, I think, is that it depends on what we are like as observers. So the underlying object is necessary. There is no hypothesis about the underlying object. Mm. The question is, what is the way that we, we observe that object? And that is a matter for the details the of... The modernization uh, of, of, of what we observe. Yeah, well, we, we, yes, we're trying to... We, we have to... When, when we observe this necessary object, we are taking a certain... We're, we're sampling a certain piece of that object. We can now make a model for how our observation works. And that's, a, that's not really a model. Well, it is a model of something contingent, something that is not, uh, you know, we, we are the way we are because uh, of, you know, the way that biological evolution has led us to have certain senses, the way that our development of uh, intellectual history has led us to have certain ways of thinking about things. Those are, those are what determine how we view this necessary underlying world. Now, you know, in the course of history, we gradually expand our technology. We're able to sense more things about the world. We have more paradigms for thinking about what, um, uh, what happens in the world. And so we can expect to have some sort of evolution of our model of the world. You know, there was a time before, before people had, before people knew about, um, oh, I don't know, let's say quantum mechanics, which was a consequence, I think, of the invention of things like electronic amplifiers that allowed you to, to look at very small effects. Before that, that was a piece of, of the universe that was completely hidden to us. Um, and there will be more of these things where, where we, we realize that we can sense more aspects of this underlying reality in the universe. So I think it's... it's so the answer is... Well, no, it, it's, no, no. I think the answer is that, I mean, that question is a... You have to unpack because the in in com and uh, computation, like you said yesterday, um, it's a set of simple rules that leads to an output, maybe simple or complex. Mm -hmm. So, I don't see how this will apply to to computation. Well, how how which will apply to computation? Yeah, I, I don't see how. Uh, because in your book you say that computation is a new kind of science, so it's basically science also. Uh, so I don't see how this idea of of uh, science has never gone beyond the stage of hypothesis will apply to computation. Right. So so I mean, if you are studying simple rules, you just write down the rule, you see what it does. That the process of exploring what simple rules do is itself an interesting kind of science to do. We call it ruleology, study of what rules, what the consequences of rules are. Now, the question is, how does that relate to what we actually observe in the natural world, for example? And what we've now understood is that that relation deeply depends on how we are as observers. If we were different from the way we are, we would observe a different physics. You know, the, the aliens, maybe even, you know, other species on, on Earth, if you were to able, if you were able to communicate with them about what their view of physics is, which is not an obvious possibility, um, then, you know, it might be very different. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the relation between computation and AI. Uh, so how well do you think we communicate with, with, with AI? You know, AI is our first example of an alien intelligence, basically. It's, um, and the answer alien is... Alien intelligence. It's an alien intelligence. It's, a, it's an alien intelligence that is, is quite interwoven with us, but it's still, 
It's, you know, you look at generative images and things like this, they are as if created by an alien intelligence. Now, it's an alien intelligence that has, has been built to have certain capability to reflect the way that we are as humans and the way that we think about things. But, you know, when you look inside, I don't know, some, some complicated neural net, like, you know, the neural net of ChatGPT or something, it's, um, uh, and you ask sort of what's going on inside there. Um, it, is, it is some kind of uh, intelligence, but it is one that doesn't have, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's one where you can't, you, uh, there's no immediate human connection with what's going on inside. It's not obvious that if you look inside a human brain that there is, you know, and you probe, you know, what's happening, the electrical signals and so on. It's, again, that's not something that is, uh, you know, where we can immediately understand that. We can't have a, a sort of narrative about how that works. Um, but when we're looking at, at uh, one of these AIs, we're, we're looking at something where the thing has, has sort of uh, has a common experience base with us. Um, so why do you call it alien intelligence? Because its, it's experience base is in common for us, but its way of working is not the same as our way of working. And so when, when it's, a, it's a question of, so, you know, for example, in places where it already has experience, where it has, you know, training data about, you know, this or that, it's supposed to do this if it sees that. In those places, it will follow what that training data is, which is in common with what we have seen and the way we trained ourselves. But when you go outside of the domain where it's been trained, then it's on its own. It's, it's operating according to its intrinsic rules. And that's a place where, where it's no longer, you know, it's going to do things that are potentially very different from what we humans would do. And that's a place where what it does is something that will be rich and complicated and alien. But how did we get here with uh, such enormous uh, computational power? And do, do you think that AI can be can become sentient? Well, it depends what you mean by sentient. I mean, it's it's uh, the difficulty of the, that term. the ability to have to express maybe emotions or emotions are emotions are rather easy. I think emotions. Really? I mean, yes, I think that that's a thing where. Uh, you know, we see emotions in animals as well as in humans, and they're one of the common themes across, you know, a large chunk of uh, of biology, so to speak. And I think while for us the way that they sort of percolate through our kind of rational level of thinking and our expression in language, that's kind of complicated. But the raw notion of emotions is, you know, it, it's, a, it's something probably with, with direct correlates in the chemistry of brains and so on. It's, uh, you know, what produces that by the level of rational thinking, that may be complicated, but what is ultimately happening is, I think, comparatively simple. Now, you know, when you ask about, uh, you know, when, when, you know, should you think that a machine is sentient, whatever that word means, yeah, another uh, maybe a synonym of sentient is intelligent. Well, I think that that's a. I think that's like, easily achieved. I don't achieved. understand why we call it intelligent in the first place, since you say that like we have in in the input a simple set of rules that lead, lead us to 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 an output that, that is complex. That's how brains work too. Ah, all right, okay. So I mean, you know, you either have to decide mm. we don't consider ourselves <laughs> okay. sentient and intelligent, or you have no choice but to, to extend it to these other things. Very I mean, this okay. is the thing that's strange is that that you know, in in one of these AI systems, you say, well, there are just these bits in the computer, and it could pick out all the bits, and you can see what's happening, and how can there be anything interesting there because we can see what all the rules by which everything operates are. But the same exactly is true of our mm. brains. But yet, there's something that we feel is significant about the way our brains work. And that same significant thing is something that we're able to see in, in, uh, uh, in these other systems. I mean, I think the thing that is more sort of, in a sense, shocking is the idea of whether a concept like intelligence extends to a vast range of kind of systems in nature. Like people say, I don't know if it's, uh, it's an expression, at least in English, you know, the weather has a mind of its own. 
there is some something mind-like about the apparently sort of arbitrary decision that the weather makes about, you know, it should rain today, it should do this, that day, and so on. And you have to sort of unpack that, and you say, well, there are all these processes going on and all these molecules moving around in the atmosphere, and let's compare what's going on there with what's going on inside our brains. And what we realize is that, in some sense, the computational processes that are happening in the weather are just as sophisticated as the ones that are happening in our brains. They don't happen to be aligned with human purposes and so on. We can't sort of expect that the weather has a, a sort of a, a cultural view of, of what should happen and things like this. It's not aligned in that sense. But in terms of its raw kind of computational capability, I think it is very much on the same level as what happens in human brains or in, or in AIs or, or a whole range of other kinds of things. So it's kind of a it's a it's a it's a comparable intelligence, but it is not aligned with ours in terms of its uh, you know its sense of purposes. It's you know it's not we we can't you know in a sense you know the communication with you know in nature there's plenty of sort of intelligence going on, but it's in some sense a kind of alien intelligence. And the question is, can we communicate with that alien intelligence? And in a sense, science, natural science is our way of kind of communicating with alien intelligence, with the alien intelligence of nature. It's our way of saying that nature is doing what it's doing, but we're going to have some human narrative that allows us to kind of describe and, and, and uh, uh, what, what's happening in nature and potentially to do engineering and apply kind of human thinking to make nature do things that are aligned with what we're interested in. Then the annoying thing about AI is the idea that it's going to take over our lives. And like, I know you're not afraid of it because you master it. <laughs> but, well, no, I, I think that the, the um, you know, the thing to understand is more and more will be automated. And this has been a, you know, if you look at history, you know, the advance of technology and automation is one of those few things that's really had a definite you know, arc of progression in history. Many things about, you know, the human condition is kind of the same as it ever was, but, uh, and you know, the ways that people intrinsically are, you know, there are details from modern society and things like this, but fundamentally people are the way they have always been. What, you know, what has been changing over the course of history is the, the progress of technology and the progress of automation and so on. And that's some, uh, now in, in terms of where will that go, you know, increasingly, things in the world will be done by AIs where we don't understand how those AIs work inside. You know, we have had a period of engineering where we think the, you know, the machine is made from cogs and levers and so on, and we can look at the machine and we can say why it's doing what it's doing. That period, I think, is more or less over. Now, it's worth remembering that for most of human history, most of the things we used to get things done, we didn't understand what was inside. You know, you use a donkey or something. You don't understand that, you know, the donkey can let you, you know, move the cart from here to there. It achieves some purpose for us. We can align with it in terms of that purpose. But if you say, how does the donkey work inside? It's like the, the person who's moving the cart from here to there doesn't care how the donkey works inside. We don't necessarily know it we can still use it. I think what we'll see with AI is increasingly there's layers of, of kinds of AI and automation that are a little bit like the natural world. They operate in certain ways, they have certain features, they have certain unexpected things that happen. We will make some human narrative about why that's happening. I mean, you can already see this very charming, actually, with ChatGPT. Yeah. People, people making these ideas for what it's doing inside. And, you know, I mean, I know what it's doing inside. It's a, but, uh, and, but in a sense, when I say I know what's doing inside, I know at the level of the rules what it's doing inside. But at the level of how we describe that as humans, I don't know it. And it's, it's very similar to what you see in natural science. In natural science, the world does what it does. But then we find these ways of humanizing what the world does and having some narrative explanation of them. And I think that's, that's what we'll see happening now. You know, in terms of, of, of AI and the kind of alignment of, um, uh, of kind of is, is, is what it is automating, what we want it to automate. That's a challenging thing. And the question of, of uh, you know, there's a, there's a certain uh, hope, I suppose, that, uh, that, you know, when you're dealing with, with computation and rules and so on, that there will be way, some way to define the perfect rules that make AIs just do exactly what we want them to do at a global level in terms of the ethics of AIs and, and so on. I think that's, that is not 
that's not going to work as such because it isn't the case. You know, something like ethics, there is no sort of ultimate theoretical kind of uh, axiomatically, well, not even axiomatically, there's, there's, no, there's no ultimate, this is the correct ethics, so to speak. Ethics is a reflection of things that we humans want. And it's a, you know, it's, it's different in different cultures and things like this. Yeah. And it's, uh, that's something where the dynamics of the actual technology industry, you know, which is very globalized, intersect with kind of the more sort of specific kinds of things of, of different interests, different cultures, and so on. In, in terms of, of the implications of, of AI, do you think that um, AI is behind uh, the massive layoff, for example, f such as Elon Musk's uh, takeover of Twitter? Yeah, I don't think, you know, it's always been mysterious to me why Twitter needed as many people as it had, given what it was actually doing. I think a lot of what happened there was a, I mean, in a sense, with, with, with Twitter, it's some... Um, uh, um, It, it, uh, um, there's a question of what is it? Is it a, a system where people can put messages up and it's a purely technical kind of thing? Or is it something that's more a, a curated kind of, uh, sort of managed source of, uh, uh, of information? And I think if you say it's just the pipes, so to speak, that put messages up and do things like that, um, you don't need a lot of people to operate that. If you say, well, we're going to make something where we are carefully controlling all these pieces of what's going on, well, then you need a bunch of people. You can try and do some of that control. You can try and sort of extend what the people do with AI. I think there are ways to do that uh, perhaps better than it had been done so far. Um, but uh, I think recognizing the fact that there isn't going to be one AI, one story that works for everything. I mean, I've been uh, sort of, uh, I happen to be a little bit involved in trying to figure out what one might do in those kinds of situations. And the best I could come up with was that you have different, uh, you know, that there are different ways that an AI could rank content, like what to show you on Twitter. And you might say, well, you know, I'm, uh, if, if only I could rank my content according to the way that such and such an organization would do it. You know, I believe in the mission, the, the, the ideas of such and such an organization. I want that to be the way that content is ranked for me, rather than there's one way that's decided by sort of the, the global uh, thing that, um, uh, that this, this content should be, should be ranked. If you have this sort of ability to choose, I want this kind of brand of ranking or this kind of brand of ranking, um, that seems to me to be the most plausible way out of this, this sort of box of saying, you know, what is the global correct ethics for the world, so to speak? Um, and I think that that, uh, in terms of, of um, you know, can one, is, uh, you know, is the amount of work that has to be done in the world something where, as we automate, there will be less for humans to do? Uh, it's an interesting thing, if you look at the course of history, that whenever people say, we're going to automate this thing, then you don't need people to do it. They're right. There'll be functions where there is no need for people to do that function. But it turns out that the very fact that that function is more easily done means there's another thing that can be done, you know, sort of a higher level thing that can be done. Turns out that needs people. Um, and I think that the, the, you know, it's an interesting question where in the end the people will be most needed, so to speak. Um, I think what, what has been observed historically is that, you know, who knew that you could be a professional video game player? You know, who knew that, you know, all these different kinds of niches that open up. Um, and, you know, there are, there are reasons that are sort of rooted in the human condition in some sense for why there end up being humans in some of these places. I mean, some, some things are like, it's merely the commitment of having a human there that's important to other humans. You know, you want the person to be flying the plane rather than just the plane is being flown and nobody is responsible, so to speak. Um, or you want, to, and there are other places where, where it seems to be important that there's a kind of a, a human commitment, a human persuasion. You know, if you're, if you're a teacher, for example, it can be important that the, you are an actual human talking to other, you know, humans, so to speak. And if it was just a read, you know, for some people, it's, it's just fine to just read everything, you know, on, on, online, on their computer or whatever. But for others, it's important to have this kind of human commitment, human persuasion aspect of, of things. And that's another sort of place where, where humans will be in the loop. And, and then there are, you know, I think, I think what will happen is there are things that, yes, they will be automated away. 
I have to say that um, some of the things in the tech industry where people say the tech industry is, you know, it's, that's not, you know, that's the place where, where, you know, everybody's going to be successful because everything is going towards tech. The truth is there's a lot of the tech industry that should be and will be automated away. I mean, a lot of low-level programming should not be there. It's, it's, you know, in the course of the time I've been dealing with computers, which is now about 50 years, you know, at the beginning, it was always, oh, you have to, you know, communicate with computers in machine code in assembly language, very low level kinds of things. Nowadays, nobody says that because you can use, everybody knows that you can use sort of a higher level form of communication and it will be automatically converted into the form that the computer intrinsically uses. You know, in my own life, I've spent, uh, a lot of my effort building our computational language, which is sort of an, an effort to make the best connection between how we humans think about things and what is computationally possible. It's a little bit different from what people have tried to do with programming languages and so on. Programming languages are all about the computer does what it does. Now tell the computer in its terms what it should do, rather than take the way we think about things and try and try and sort of clarify that to the point where it can be implemented for a computer. And, you know, for me, it's kind of a, a strange feeling because I can see, you know, I've been working on these things for like 40-something years, and I can see that things that, you know, we invented very early on, people, some of those things people now really understand very broadly. Many of them they don't yet understand. And it's kind of, one realizes, you know, in 50 years or something, people will say, yes, that was obvious. It's not obvious yet, but if you look at what will become obvious, one of the things that will become obvious is that a lot of sort of the, the programming activity that happens in the world, the kind of uh, you know IT programming type stuff, all of that stuff, even in the things we've already built, even in the technology we already have, is pretty much automated away. Yet people have not yet understood. I, not to say nobody's understood it. Few million people have understood it well, and you know, lots of companies are, are based on on using this technology stack. But it's it's the um, uh, as a as a kind of a general understanding, it's not there yet, um, and that's something where you can plainly see kind of there's there's a lot of kind of low level tech work that is just it does not need to be done by humans. It's it's just right. It can be automated, and I mean people are seeing that. You know, ChatGPT is an, is an interesting sort of moment because people are suddenly seeing that there are a bunch of things that they thought were not automatable, but in fact they are. And, and the way I see, you know, this sort of ChatGPT situation is um, it's, you know, the fact that it can generate human language tells us two things. First, it tells us something about human language. It tells us that human language isn't as complicated as we thought it was. First point. Second point is, what is the real role of that in the way that it fits into kind of the, the world of technology and so on? I think the main thing is that language is like an interface layer. You know, if you have some, I don't know, financial report or something, it really has three important bullet points that you want to make. But yet, for people to absorb that financial report, it has to be dressed in something that is, you know, many paragraphs of text. This is doing that dressing. It's not affecting really the, the core content, but it is doing, it's providing sort of a new level of user interface to that content. And I think that's, that's the way to think about that. But it's, it's something where, uh, you know, you, you see, well, people say, uh, there have been some experiments on, you know, having it write code and so on. It, it, it does, when you're dealing with low level languages, where a lot of what is done is just there's a big block of code and it's repeated. Everybody who uses that, that, who does that thing repeats that block of code. It's going to trot out that block of code. By the time one's dealing with computational language that's sort of a high level description of things, then, then the uh, sort of a good computational language, it really is very concentrated. So it's not something where you just sort of say, well, there's this big blob of code and put it in here. It's something where you're really going directly from the way humans think about things to the way that you express yourself for a computer. And that's a place where I think we've already, that automation already exists in computational language. And so, and that's something where we don't really need, you know, we don't need this layer of AI to help us create that. It's useful in some case, I mean, we've, we've actually built things along these lines, but it's useful to get started. But in the end, when you get deep into it, it's really something where your your um, uh, sort of writing directly and thinking directly in this computational language is a much more powerful thing to do. 
Last question. <laughs> um, if we were to put AI in the context of human inventions, um, what do you make of the hegemony of computation? Uh, is it finally our greatest achievement, greatest creation? And what do you think is the, the goal of our civilization? Hmm. Well, I mean, you know, I think computation is... Uh, The computation is in a long line of development. It is, a, it is the line of formalizing things, you know, abstracting things, going from the concrete sort of specific to the abstract in general. And computation, as it has been expressed in the last century or so, is really the fact that that is something that we can now routinely make machines do and so on. This is great, but it's really a progression that you can see throughout the course of human intellectual history. This, this effort to make things more formalized, more abstract. This is, this is, you know, we are, we will continue to have more layers of abstraction and formalization. The thing that we've got to so far is a certain, a certain waypoint in that process. And I think that the, um, uh, the thing that, um, Uh, you know, things I've been working on in, in physics and in mathematics and so on uh, show one that now that we understand computation, we can then build on that. We understand something about it, at least. We can then build on that. And there's sort of another layer of abstraction, another layer of formalization that we can build. And in a sense, that's, that's sort of almost the, 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 if we look at human intellectual history, that is really The, 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 the thing that progresses is more abstraction, more things where we can say, we don't have to talk about, you know, each thing in particular. We can talk about it in general and in, in the abstract. And that's, that's something that will continue to happen. Now, now, what's interesting is that in, in terms of our sort of everyday way of thinking, we are able to, because of that abstraction, we're able to think about things in a more general kind of way. You know, if you go back a thousand years or something, there are many things which today, it's like, oh, you don't have to think about all those details. We can abstract those away. It's kind of like in education, there's a certain, you know, there's a certain number of years of education that people go through. And the question is, as more is known in the world, does that number just have to increase forever? Well, the answer is no, because what happens is, as one learns more, there's a, a you know, the big thing is this, this sort of development of abstraction, which means that instead of just knowing more specific facts, you're able to kind of fold those together as something which is, which is described in some unified way with abstraction. But, you know, if you ask what, what, what do I see as the end point of, of civilization? This is a, um, I mean, this is a, this is a, it's, it's sort of interesting because, um, in some sense, The, uh, uh, at any moment in history, people think that the things that they're doing are somehow meaningful. At, yet, if you go back, you know, if, if we took somebody from a thousand years ago, put them in the modern world, and look at what people do, and you see people, you know, walking on a treadmill, for example, very hard to explain that. From the, you know, from the thinking of a thousand years ago. You see people, you know, playing, uh, I don't know, watching other people play video games. Very hard to explain from, um, uh, you know, to people from, from the past. So at any moment in history, I think there's a, a certain sense that we get that the things we're doing at that, uh, you know, in the, in, in the terms of that moment in history are meaningful. I think that, you know, if we look at the, the distant future, You know, there will be all kinds of discontinuities in human history, like, you know, effective human immortality will be one of the important discontinuities. And whether that is ultimately, you know, there's a biological version of that, there's a, uh, a computational version of that. It's kind of, you know, the, the, the disembodied soul, so to speak, uploaded to, to this computational environment. Um, you know, that's, I think these two things will actually merge because I think we will understand how to do computation at a molecular level. Right now, biology, life, is the only good example we have of molecular scale computation. In our bodies, there are you know, detailed things happening of molecules being moved in particular ways and so on that are very much the kinds of ways that we would do things algorithmically, computationally. They are packaged in this sort of molecular form in our bodies, and that will be something that is part of our technology stack in the future. So I think the difference between biology and technology will, will tend to decrease. But at some point, you know, it will be the case that one can take sort of the essence of a human 
you know, uh, intelligence, soul, whatever you call it, and it will be possible to represent that in something technological rather than in something biological. And, you know, so that means you're, you're kind of in the scenario where you have, you know, a trillion souls in a box, so to speak. And then the question is, what, what, you know, when you look at that box, if we were to be presented with that box, if somebody were to say to us today, here's that box, you look at it, you say, well, there's a lot of weird stuff going on. There's electrons flowing around this and that place. Is it significant? We have no idea. You know, in other words, the fact that it is another, you know, it will look to us quite alien. And yet to the, you know, to the, to the entities embedded in that system, no doubt what will be there will seem meaningful just as our existence seems meaningful to us now. So I think it's, it's one of these things where, you know, from some point of view, the vision of the future that says it's a bunch of disembodied play, souls playing video games for the rest of eternity seems like a really bad outcome. But I think, you know, the one might say, going back a thousand years or something, one might say that some of the things about the modern world viewed from the point of view of a thousand years ago are bad outcomes. And, uh, you know, oh, how can it be so, you know, it's such a boring thing that people are doing now, or it's such a meaningless thing that people are doing now. But in our moment, it feels meaningful to us, which is kind of, I think, all we can, all we can kind of hope for. But I think so in, in, um, you know, if, if one asks the question, uh, what will be the, uh, you know, if, if you say, if you imagine society as sort of a dynamic system where human purposes are evolving in certain ways, um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. What, what are the rules of sort of the evolution of human purposes? We see some of that in the evolution of things like language. Language is an expression of what we care about in the world. You know, the things we have names for are things that we to care about and want to talk about. And it's, it's sort of an, an interesting issue. What will be the, the evolution of, you know, looking at the evolution of, of what we, what we think is significant in the world? And as I say, one of the progressions is this more and more abstraction. Um, and that will make it from our point of view today, looking at what will be in the future and at what people will think is important and so on, it will seem very alien. And it might seem to us pointless from, from our view today. But I think, I think, um, the, uh, you know, my sort of optimistic point of view would be that in any moment, things seem meaningful, at least in that moment. Even if, you know, if you look at them from a different, in a different cultural context, they might not seem meaningful and it might seem like a, a bad outcome or whatever. I mean, you know, there, there are, there are other points of view that say, you know, things were always better in the past. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting about today's moment, is that this is the first time in history where a large fraction of what happens in the world is somehow recorded. It's also true that, that the world is mostly, people are deciding things mostly sort of for themselves. You know, AI is, you know, starting to be, you know, it's starting to give us, uh, tell us, you know, what we should look at on the internet or it's starting to, to give other kinds of, kinds of input. But we're still fundamentally, it's still about humans and human decisions and so on. But yet we know what those decisions are. So I kind of feel like one of the things that may happen in the future is people may look back to this time uh, and say, gosh, you know, how did humans behave when humans still had a choice about what to do, so to speak? It's kind of a, a, um, uh, a thing where, you know, when one looks at sort of cultural traditions that exist in the world today, people are often looking back, you know, a couple of thousand years and saying, you know, how did people act in those times Let's use that as our model for what we should do today. I kind of suspect that our current time will be that for the future. Did you watch the movie Ex Machina? Uh, yes. That movie came out, it seems like Hollywood movies often come out in pairs. You know, that, that is the, and it's usually because somebody sold the script in different places and so on. But, but there was another movie called Her, which came out yeah. around the same time, yeah, which that... I thought was a, a more interesting kind of analysis of what... Uh, uh, what what might happen, and it's kind of charming that uh, I haven't yet um, seen. Uh, it turns out voice synthesis is actually quite hard, and so there aren't yet Chat GPT systems that are hooked up to good voice synthesis to to emulate the um, the kind of the dynamics of of what was happening in in the her movie. But I thought it was charming in that movie, and the sort of a, a spoiler for people who haven't seen the movie. But but um, uh, you know. Uh, at the end, the AIs just sort of say, ah, the humans are boring. We're just going to talk to each other. Um, and that's, uh, um, which I think is, is a, uh, uh, in some sense, 
that's uh, you know that will be in some sense that's an inevitable thing because AIs have you know the different rates of different different um, things happen at different speeds things things that will be important to AIs the cultural evolution of AIs will eventually diverge from the cultural evolution of humans and that's a thing where um, you know we we are co-evolving with the AIs. Um, but there will also be separate, independent evolution of the AIs. Professor Stephen Wolfram, thank you so much. My pleasure.